this is pretty much a slideless talk. Uh, really, the only slide you need is the one right behind me. Uh, everything that I refer to is linked to from this site, questioncopyright.org. Um, I'm very glad to see you all here. Thanks, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, it's nice to see that many people interested in copyright, its history, and its effects. Uh, before I begin the talk proper, I want to tell you about a talk by the Google Policy Team at 3.30 over in Tech Talk 42, Paramaribo. Um, they've come in from Washington, D.C., and they're going to tell us what they're doing there, net neutrality, child protection, other stuff. I guarantee you these two talks will not overlap because I'm going to that talk. So you don't have to worry. You can go to it, too. Um, and speaking of Google policy, uh, I want to start out with a disclaimer. The content of my talk is not in any way the official position of Google on copyright or intellectual property or anything else. It has not been endorsed by the Google policy team, not by the Google legal team. Um, I'm very glad that Google is the sort of organization that hosts open forums like this, uh, but they should not be held responsible for its content. Um, and with that, let's begin. You do not hear a lot these days about the history, uh, the origins of copyright. Uh, I think, based on talking to a lot of people, we sort of tend to feel that it's just always been there. Or it's one of those things that, uh, like building roads or, or constructing sewers or something, it's something that governments just start doing at a certain point. It's, it's natural and uncontested. Um, that's not actually the case with copyright. Uh, in fact, some people will trace it back, uh, if, they're, if they're a lawyer or they've read some legal history, they'll trace it back as far as the US Constitution, where there is a clause uh, empowering Congress to pass copyright legislation. Um, but copyright's history predates even that. Um, and it is kind of surprising where it comes from. It was not created by um, artists and writers who were suddenly rising up to demand protection at all. It was created by the publishing industry which uh, in the early days of the printing press was a very different industry from what it is today. Uh, information distribution in general was very different than it is today. I won't have time to go into all the details of that history. Uh, I want to fit this talk into an hour. I want to have time to talk about the implications of copyright history for how we think about and deal with copyright today. And I especially want to leave time for questions at the end. So if you go to that website or you uh, go look at some other resources on the history of copyright, You'll see some stuff that I'm leaving out here. I don't think any of it is. Uh, oh, thank you, screensaver. Um, I don't think any of those details that I leave out are uh, terribly important, but um, you might want to know them if you're doing a lot of uh, research into copyright. So where did it come from? Well, when the printing press first arrived in England in the late 1470s, um, mid-1470s, late 1400s, uh, there was no such thing as copyright. In fact, not only was there no copyright, there was a government and a society pretty much completely unprepared for the implications of the mass distribution of printed material. Um, it was just the Wild West out there. As soon as the press arrived, people began running off copies of just anything under the sun. Historical works, um, fact, fiction, religious tracts, political tracts, works by living authors and dead authors. They were not careful about crediting. Um, they would engage in plagiarism and reverse plagiarism. Sometimes a printer would write something, print it up, and release it under the name of an author who had nothing to do with it because that author was more famous, and that way the work would get more attention. Um, all sorts of things went on. It was total chaos. From the government's point of view, the worst aspect of this chaos was the political tracts. All of a sudden, anyone with a printing press and a grievance could start running off seditious pamphlets by the thousands and distribute them all over the kingdom. If you're a government, especially in England in the 15th century uh, and 16th century, that's a disaster. You can't just have people printing anything they want. Who knows what they might say? They might, they might uh, foment rebellion, make trouble. So the government's reaction was very interesting. They, uh, it shows us, I think, that the idea of privatization of social services was not invented in modern times. I'm just going to hit a key here. I should have learned how to turn off my screensaver. Uh, there you go. Sorry. Um, shh, don't tell. Um, they, they, the government, sorry? It's OK. We're with the slide now. We'll just stay there for now. And if the screensaver goes on, we won't worry about it. Um, the government's reaction was to privatize censorship. They created a guild 
called the Company of Stationers. Um, the company's charter gave it the sole right, with a couple of exceptions, the sole right to own and operate printing presses in England. Um, the, the company had the right to seize and destroy presses operated by non-members of the company. And they had the right to burn books printed without the company's authorization. In return for this monopoly, the company of stationers was obligated to run the works they printed by the crown's censors first. Uh, naturally, after a certain amount of time, they got pretty good at telling what the censor would and wouldn't like. And they would just do self-censorship. They wouldn't even bother. They would say, look, that's never going to fly. You can't print that. Um, this arrangement lasted for about 150 years. And during that entire time, there is still no such thing as copyright. Um, the stationers did, among themselves, practice uh, a certain kind of proto-copyright. They would make arrangements um, where one person, one member of the company would print one thing and no one else would print that. And they were actually formal little agreements. Um, so this notion of ownership of a work did begin to take hold among the printing community. But it was ownership by the printer, and it was ownership of printing rights. It had nothing to do with the author. The works were entered into the company of stationers registry under the stationer's name, not the author's. So this worked pretty well for about 150 years, until almost 1700. Um, and then disaster came. Disaster for the company of stationers, at any rate, although not for lovers of free speech. The government of England changed hands. Uh, this is the revolution of 1688, the glorious revolution is sometimes called. I won't go into all the details of that revolution. It's very complex um, and very important in its own way, independently of copyright. But among the effects, to simplify greatly, and I hope historians in the audience will forgive me, um, among its effects were that parliament changed hands. And what, in some senses, had been the opposition now came into power, and furthermore, Parliament's power relative to the crown was greatly strengthened. Those now in power had no love for, state, for um, censorship and no love for the company of stationers, for the most part. And they decided to let the company's charter lapse. Now, if you have any experience with government-regulated monopolies, you know that the story is never that simple. You can't just turn them off once you have them, because they lobby. And that's what the stationers did. They went before Parliament. Uh, realizing that their, their livelihood, their monopoly on printing was about to end, and they made a rather new argument. They said, an author has a natural right of ownership in their work, and furthermore, this right is transferable, assignable by contract to other parties. Like a form of property, it can be sold, or contracted out, or leased. Parliament accepted this argument. And the reasons why are perhaps a bit hard to understand today. You have to cast yourself back into the mindset of information technology in the 18th century. The Parliament did not like censorship, uh, though they probably sensed that it had its uses. Um, but they didn't necessarily want a return to the chaos of the period between the arrival of the printing press and the chartering of the company of stationers. And the stationers were essentially saying to Parliament, if you do not protect our trade with this monopoly right, we will have an economic disincentive to behave well. We will not be able to print things reliably, to make identical copies, to avoid um, plagiarisms, both of the normal and the reverse kind, and to protect the integrity of works if it's just a complete free market. Because consider what a print run means. You have to gather a lot of dead tree pulp. No screens there? That's good. Um, you have to gather a lot of dead tree pulp together. You have to arrange the plates for your press, which is quite labor intensive. Um, if there are illustrations, you have to get an engraver and, and make those illustrations in metal. And then you print off thousands of copies. At great expense, you distribute them around, which may cost some money as well. And then you see if your work sells. You haven't even collected any revenue yet. Now, what if your competitors waiting in the wings can just watch you invest in 100 works, watch the three of them that actually pay off and start selling, and then they run off copies of just those works? Well, they're not paying the, the cost of investment in all the other 97. They have much lower risk. 
the stationer's argument was, we need to be protected from that situation. We're, we're caught in this sort of game theoretical dilemma. If you give us a monopoly, we will behave better. You also have to think of the technology of printing. Uh, it's often said that the internet is, is sort of an extension or an augmentation of the printing press, kind of the final re realization of the printing press's potential. But there's an important sense in which that's wrong. If you have a copy of a printed work and a printing press, especially an 18th century printing press, making a copy of that work is terribly difficult. And if it has illustrations, it's just not possible. You can duplicate them to some degree of approximation, but you can't really make a copy. And as far as the words of the text, you're going to be very tempted to abridge the chapters you think are boring. You're going to have more misspellings because you won't have time to do it with the same care the original printer did. With the printing press, you can only make more copies if you possess the master. With the internet, you can make copies from copies. The internet is masterless. In fact, with the internet, making perfect copies is what comes naturally. And if you want them to have any variation, you have to put an extra effort to do that. It's the reverse of the printing press. They don't think like we think today. They were thinking, look, there's a natural monopoly physically inherent in printing because whoever prints it first has sort of created the work that's out there in the public, and they've got the original plates. And if we just make our laws embody this monopoly without the odium of censorship, then we will have essentially the same arrangement we had during the entire 150 years of the Company of Stationers' heyday. And everything will be just as good as it was then, only without censorship. And Parliament didn't really object. And it was actually a fairly reasonable argument, given the technology and given the economics of the time. But if you remember just one thing from this talk, please let it be. Copyright was not designed by the writers and artists asking for a means to earn a living, for an economic basis for creativity. It was designed by the publishing industry to support a certain kind of distribution mechanism, one that is completely obsolete today. So let's fast forward a bit. I've been going around for about a decade talking to just about everyone I meet about copyright. Um, I mean, literally, I will talk to strangers at the bus stop, taxi drivers, free software developers and IRC channels, um, strangers at parties, just, just everyone. And I've compiled a pretty good picture, I think, of how people think about copyright, um, especially in the United States, but also I've been doing this in Europe a little. Um, what you hear when you talk to people about copyright does not look like that. You hear four or five points consistently over and over. They are, uh, one, artists and writers, they need copyright to earn a living. They depend on it. It's very important to them. Without copyright, they're just they're out in the cold, cruel world. Pretty much everybody will express that sentiment at some point when talking about copyright. The second thing you hear is copyright is largely about protection from plagiarism. Over and over, I hear sentiments like, if somebody writes a book, they should get credit for it. Now, modern copyright law is not really about preventing plagiarism, as you probably already know. Um, and especially given the internet, it's very easy to find out who really wrote uh, a work first. There is a reason people think that plagiarism is one of the primary functions of copyright. And that is that every time the copyright lobby talks to Congress or puts out a press release or issues a cease and desist letter, they include a sentence about how artists have to be protected from plagiarism because they know that that resonates emotionally with all of us. And I can give you some pretty glaring examples of this. In fact, I will, because it's just too good to resist. This is Hillary Rosen, the former head of the Recording Industry Association of America, um, talking to a college audience. Uh, it's from a few years back, um, late 90s, maybe early 2000s. Um, so this, she's describing here what she says as she goes around talking about the importance of not copying things to college students. She says, analogies are really what work best. I ask them, what have you done last week? And they might say, they wrote a paper on this or that. So I tell them, oh, you wrote a paper and you got an A? Would it bother you if somebody could just take that paper and get an A too? So this sense of personal investment does ring true with people. Well, she's right, it does ring true with people. 
but her analogy is completely inapplicable to copyright because when people download songs from the internet, they don't replace the artist's name with their own. In fact, they recommend the file to their friends and they say, hey, check out this band, and they give the band's name accurately. What she should have asked was, what if somebody could show your paper around and show everyone else that you got an A? Would you have a problem with that? And of course, the students would have said, no, we don't have a problem with that. This technique, this tactic, is once you are, excuse me, once you are watching out for it, you will see it in just about every article, every press release, every mention by an industry lobbyist or industry figure about copyright. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. And this, I think, is part of the reason why the standard answer you get when you talk to people in the street about copyright is artists have to be protected from plagiarism. The third thing is that everyone makes it clear that they want to be thought of as the artist's friend. Everyone is on their side. Over and over, you hear the sentiment, you know, I might download songs from the internet, but when I go to a concert of a band, I'll buy the CD because I want to support the band. It's a very, very emotionally powerful thing to tell people that by obeying copyright, they are on the side of the artist. That's where everyone wants to be. Nobody wants to be on the publisher's side. Publishers are big, evil corporations. Um, and in fact, people have started to become conscious that publishers are making all the money from copyright. But if you tell people copyright is protecting the artists, then they will feel funny about violating copyright laws. And the industry has learned this 100%. They know how to talk. Um, the fourth thing is that people are very ambivalent about file sharing. Um, just about everyone I ask says either that they do it or they know people who do or they kind of smile funny and then they don't say whether they do it or not and you know that they do it. Um, and when you ask them how they feel about it, you get these strange kind of answers. Like I've, I've heard people say, well, I know it might not be the most right thing to do, but really, who's it hurting? It's like people know in their gut that it's really not hurting the artist, but they still feel this residual guilt about it because there's this incessant message coming from the industry File sharing is bad. File sharing hurts the artist. I don't think there's any evidence that file sharing hurts the artist. I've certainly never seen any. Um, it does hurt the publishing industry somewhat. Um, <clears throat> if you would like to see, by the way, some of these, these answers, a couple of friends, uh, Googlers also, uh, Ben Colin Sussman and Brian Fitzpatrick, and I, we went around Chicago uh, this summer with a video camera, and we interviewed people in the street about their thoughts on copyright. And if you go to... Um, That website, questioncopyright.org, all one word, no hyphen for those on video. Um, you can download that video and watch. It's really striking people's reactions to the questions about file sharing. They're in this kind of weird moral quandary because they want to do it, their friends do it, they don't feel like it's wrong, and yet they feel like it's wrong. Now, here's one thing you never hear when you talk to people about copyright. Nobody has ever in 10 years said to me, Copyright was invented by distributors to subsidize and stabilize a certain kind of distribution technology. Nope. That part of the history has been completely wiped from our, our world consciousness. Um, even books about copyright, when you get to the part in the, of the beginning of the book where it talks about how copyright begins, if there are books in English uh, in the United States, they will talk about the constitutional clause. That, that says Congress has, shall have the power to reserve to inventors and authors the exclusive right to their discoveries, et cetera. Um, that clause post-dates the Company of Stationers and the passing of the Statute of Anne, the law that Parliament passed granting the author's monopoly. Um, post-dates it by about <clears throat> 70 years, 65 years. So. And, and it was not a new idea when the authors of the Constitution put it in there. They were essentially putting into American law what was already law and habit and, and a way of thinking in England. This was not a, an invention. So the Constitution is not the beginning of copyright. The true beginning has largely been forgotten. The implications of all this um, are, are pretty big. As you're probably aware, there's a a very large debate going on about what should the relationship between the internet and copyright be. Um, I think that debate is especially relevant to Google. We are a company that flourishes in an environment where information is free to flow unrestricted. Um, 
But the trouble is that that debate is currently being had on terms that are purely defensive for those people who want to copy and share things. What, what has been going on is because, because the background assumption of this debate is copyright is there to protect artists and help them earn a living, the, <clears throat> the industry will always say, well, if you pay to buy a copy, shouldn't you pay every time you see it? And then we come back with, well, look, there should be some, some openings carved out for fair use. I mean, OK, yes, they should have the right to sell it, and, and you know, nobody else should be able to sell it unless the author gives them that right. But, <clears throat> but let, us, let us have a few things that are fair use. On those terms, this debate is never going to go in the right direction. The right direction being, I think, a realization on our part that the internet the proper use of the internet is simply fundamentally incompatible with copyright law. <clears throat> now, if you're worried about protection from plagiarism, in one second, which a lot of people are, the experience of the open source world is very instructive. I've been working in open source for 15 years, um, been talking to people who've been in it for 20 or more. Open source essentially happens without copyright. Um, yes, there are licenses on the software, but that's, that's sort of to help perpetuate freedoms that wouldn't need to be perpetuated if there were no such thing as copyright. Essentially, you can think of free software as operating in one of the first copyright-free spaces we've had in 300 years. And there simply is not a problem with plagiarism in the open source world. I'm not saying it never happens. It may. Um, I can't remember any cases off the top of my head. And when you do a search for, for plagiarism, open source, free software, uh, I spent a long time doing that search the other night, and I couldn't find a single example. Instead, what I found were open source plagiarism detection packages. So it is a, at least certain that you can say plagiarism in the free software world, one of the first copyright free spaces uh, to exist on the internet, is no worse a problem than it is in the mainstream publishing world, where plagiarism still happens. And you, every now and then, you'll read an article about it. Um, if you're still worried about plagiarism, imagine this. Let us suppose that there was a company that crawls the web all the time gathering data. I'm not going to mention any names. And suppose that this company remembered the timestamps of the files that it saw, and it remembered their URLs, and it computed a checksum for each URL, and it found out through meta information such as tags or, or something like that, maybe even the author of the information. And it recorded all these things in a database. Remember, it's not even saving the files themselves. I'm not talking about the cached copy. What if it just saved that, all those checksums and URLs and author names and stuff and maybe a little description in a database? And then at the end of every day, it sorted that database. And then it took a checksum of the sorted concatenated database. And it published that checksum in a little classified ad in the back pages of the Wall Street Journal every day. You now have a plagiarism detection or a, or a priority database engine that cannot be corrupted even by the people running it. I don't really think this is necessary. I think there might be some other interesting applications for such a database. <coughs> such a database. But the problem of plagiarism has been solved already. Copyright has nothing to do with it. In fact, when you let things float around freely on the internet, that makes it possible to detect the original much more quickly. Um, this is why, by the way, it's so ironic that the Publishers Association and the Authors Guild are suing Google Book Search, which promises to be, if we match snippets of text together in the right way, the first and best plagiarism engine ever built. You would think they would be cheering us. Um, but unfortunately, they are suing us. I think it would be nice if somebody pointed out to them that this holds a lot of potential for preventing and detecting plagiarism. Um, Another question that, that was a serious problem back in the days of the printing press and, um, and unregulated printing in England was the integrity of the work. I mean, you, if you had two copies of a book back in the day, you couldn't even be sure that they were identical, even if they had the same author's name on the front. Somebody might have added whole sections, left out sections, et cetera. That is also no longer a problem. Making perfect copies is what the internet does naturally. You don't have to do extra work to make a perfect copy of a copy. Um, now, the internet does allow you to modify those copies very easily as well, but that's okay. Usually when people do that, they, they say so. 
um, there are not that many cases of, of people corrupting or changing someone else's work and then going out of their way to make sure that there's no trace of it and, and putting out the new work as though it were the original. And where there are such cases, they're usually easily, easily detectable. So then we get to the, the final question, the one that, that um, the copyright lobby wants you to ask, which is, but without copyright, how will artists and writers make a living? This is a great example of a question that is best answered by being unasked. Copyright is not how artists and writers make a living today, and it has never been. I mean, you all know some musicians, right? You know writers. I'm, I'm a writer. I've got two books published that are under open copyright. Copyright isn't, isn't paying anyone's living. There are a few superstars. Um, Stephen King is certainly making out very well. More power to him. But it doesn't make any sense for society to organize the way it shares information around the production of a few superstars while everyone else ends up either in debt or breaking even. The ways that people make a living from creativity, meaning not just writing but also um, music and performing arts in general, are through a variety of means that have been true for centuries, for a long time before copyright, during copyright, and, and from now on. They will continue to be true. Their patronage, uh, the day job, subscriptions. Subscriptions, by the way, paid for a lot of writing um, back in the early days of the printing press, including the writings of many writers that the copyright lobby likes to tout as examples of copyright supporting artists. Samuel Johnson is a great example. He made very little money from copyright. Many of his works were paid for in advance by subscribers who paid in anticipation of the work coming out. Um, for musicians and other performers, performance is the main means of income. Um, there are also piecework in commissions. A lot of writers who make a living writing do so by commissions from magazines. And the magazine's revenue itself is not heavily dependent on copyright royalties. It's dependent on advertising and subscriptions. Um, and traditional publishing still works without copyright. I mean, my publisher was willing to release my stuff under open copyright because they, by signing a contract with you, they cause a work to come into existence. They get control over the timing. They get some control over the marketing. Um, and it makes sense to pay someone to produce a work, which you're then going to release for free, if you're going to be the first to market with thousands of copies. So traditional publishing doesn't have to go anywhere. There are also new methods of supporting creativity that are possible now that we have the internet with the free flow of information, the easy attachment of metadata, um, and micropayments. Um, here's, a, here's a very good example, which this idea has been floating around a lot. I think it's been independently reinvented several times. And now there's a group called fundable.org, uh, which has actually implemented it. Suppose there's a writer who wants to write her next novel, and she knows it'll cost her $50,000 just to, to pay for rent and groceries during the amount of time it'll take to write that novel. So she posts on her blog, all right, I'm ready to write, but it's going to cost $50,000. She goes to a third-party intermediary organization, or maybe they find her, um, because they're taking a small commission from this deal. <clears throat> That organization goes around to known fans of the author um, and anyone else, hopefully they don't spam any mailing lists, and say, OK, make your pledges. Pledge whatever amount you feel you can pay. We're not going to collect until we have $50,000 worth of pledges, or maybe $60,000 to, to pay for the commission. So some people pledge, some don't. Doesn't matter. If it's a good writer, eventually you're going to reach the right amount. I mean, it only takes. <clears throat> a few people, well, a few thousands of people, pledging small amounts of money to reach that sum. And now the writer writes the work under contract with the intermediary, releases the work for free to the world on the internet, and the pledges get called in and paid to the writer. There are some interesting properties of this system. The work exists for free and is available to the whole world. The writer got what she needed to produce the work. And nobody paid more for the work than they were willing to pay. There's no need to restrict sharing in order to pay for things. Uh, maybe a broader way to think of it is this. If there are people out there who want to produce, and there are people out there who want to consume, when did we stop believing that the free market is going to find a way to get those people together? We don't need a monopoly right to make that happen. Um, 
if we have a distribution technology that doesn't require high upfront centralized investments, and we don't anymore. So let me conclude with a little lobbying of my own. This sentiment, this idea that copyright is really about subsidizing a certain kind of distribution technology and not about subsidizing creativity has almost no currency today. And as long as it has no currency, the debate on copyright can only go in one direction. The first thing I would ask you is that if you find yourself in a flame war on Slashdot with somebody about copyright, please just say that sentence and then point them to that website. That meme can spread very quickly because people want to believe it. They want file sharing. They already are halfway to believing that publishers are abusing the copyright and cheating artists. And in fact, they do literally cheat uh, many times. I don't have time to share, you some stories, share with you some stories about that, but there's a lot of evidence to believe that publishers' bookkeeping <clears throat> is not accurate in many cases. Um, once that meme starts getting out, this debate may finally start to change. If it doesn't change, we, meaning the world, and we, meaning Google, are headed for disaster. Because what's going on now is that copyright terms are being extended to infinite lengths. Um, copyright interpretations are being strengthened so that the, the circle of what constitutes fair use is getting ever smaller. And the very worst thing is that copyright protection is being built into our hardware. No, that's not even the worst thing. That's the second worst thing. The very worst thing is that copyright protections are being built into law such that it is proposed in some jurisdictions, and I don't think this is law anywhere yet, <coughs> that software and hardware be required to pay attention to digital watermarks and refuse to copy files that are marked a certain way. <clears throat> now, think about that we would actually not be allowed to build a piece of software or a piece of hardware that could copy files that have a certain bit string at the front. What are we, what, are, what is Google gonna do when the Linux kernel code is required by law not to copy certain files? <clears throat> That's an amazing prospect. What are we gonna do when we can't crawl the web because we're not allowed to hold a file in memory long enough to index it? This company, as I said, flourishes on the free flow of information. And the freer the world's information, the better off we are, and the better off the world is. Please don't feel guilty about copying. You're not doing anything wrong, even if increasingly you're doing something illegal. Please don't think that balance is the right approach, that there is some, some negotiation in which the rights of creators and, and the publishing industry are balanced against the good of the public. The public's good and the creator's good are one and the same. It is the free flow of accurately attributed works on the internet, <clears throat> such that everyone has access to creative output. Everyone can easily identify who created what, <clears throat> and can use essentially the same techniques that they've been using all along to compensate those creators. Helping those people find each other, that's the business we should be in. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's take a drink. I'm, as I watch the progression of ever tighter, ever more restrictive copyright laws, in a battle that I thought was going to go the other way, because I thought the meaning of the internet was obvious, I get worried. And I think <clears throat> our great-grandchildren are going to look back at us, at our generation, in wonder and amazement, and they're going to ask, how on earth <clears throat> excuse me, could we have built a gigantic worldwide copying machine and then hesitated to use it to its full potential? How on earth could we not have been able to tell the difference between stealing a bicycle and copying a song? I don't know how we're going to explain ourselves to them. OK, that's the end of the rant. I would love to take questions. Yeah, I want to talk to this claim that plagiarism is a non-issue. Yes. Um, I'm thinking about Disney Company being very worried for the copyright on the image of Mickey Mouse is going to expire. Mm -hmm. And they're worried that people are going to use Mickey for their own purposes in cartoons and advertisements and so forth. And therefore, kind of get some of the you know, magic or the, the 
associations with Disney with their products about compensation or permission. Yes. Is that a uh, So I'm going to repeat the question for, for uh, people on the recording. <coughs> Companies like Disney are worried that if Mickey Mouse uh, or similar objects, let's call them, go out of copyright, that people will start using those images for their own purposes. Um, and that then that'll sort of be, those purposes will then have the, the aura of Disney associated with them. And that's kind of a form of plagiarism. It isn't it something we should protect. Um, that is a legitimate worry. I don't think it's as great as, as it might be because right now, when somebody uses someone else's um, work, we assume that there has been some sort of contractual relationship. We, we assume, because of the existence of copyright law, that there must be an endorsement or an agreement between those two parties. And if that assumption were not there, then when you, you were to see someone using Mickey Mouse, you wouldn't think that Disney had anything to do with it. Now, you're right that this would mean that people can start using characters from someone else's novel in their own novel, for example and that there would be nothing the original creator could do about it. But the original novel doesn't go away. The original novel will not be tainted by those uses. And although it may be slightly discomforting, especially to those of us who grew up during the copyright regime, to think about that happening, is it worth preventing people from sharing information? Is that, is that very minor benefit worth saying to people, you just can't copy that at all? You can't use that. So that, that's my answer. Um, there's a lot. Uh, you, sir. Um, so I'm a little confused about your position. I mean, so if I say I, I wrote a book or I, I wrote a song, and I just want to put it up on my website, and my position is just that, my preference is that, like, I don't want Google to index this, or I don't want mm -hmm. anybody else to copy this file and host it on their own servers. Should, like, do you think that that position should be supported by the law or not? There's no publisher involved. It's just no, uh, actually, no, no, I don't. Um, what I think should be supported by the law is that your name cannot be stripped and no one else can claim the credit for it. That is, credit, reputation, is a non-renewable resource. It cannot be replicated. It can't be copied. It, to the degree that someone takes credit for your stuff, that's the degree to which you lose credit. It's always proportional. But if they accurately credit you, well, look, if you don't want people to copy the thing, don't put it on the web. Pass it around to your friends. So, so no, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me. And I'm not sure realistically that it bothers any creator of music. I mean, you know, when I put writings on the web, I want people to copy them. Yeah, I don't know. I would disagree with that. I, I, don't, I, well, I don't completely buy that, but yeah. oh, Okay. I mean, um, unfortunately, it's not a good forum for that kind of conversation. Sure, so sure. I'll have to leave that, but, but sure. thanks for asking. Um, yes. Um, when, you, when you propose that every, all of the fans of this novelist um, contribute or pledge some small amount of money, um, why doesn't the tragedy of the commons happen where just everyone assumes someone else will pay for this guy? Uh, because um, the tragedy of the commons operates in a slightly, in a subtly but importantly different theoretical environment. In this case, you don't actually pledge the money until, you, until there's a signed contract. Or that is, your, your money isn't going to get called out, right? You won't actually be getting anything out of your bank account until someone has promised and signed a contract to deliver the work. So if you're sitting there and you've, you've made your pledge, but your money hasn't actually been called yet, and you see that nothing's happening, well, maybe you add a little more. Or maybe you don't. But the point is that the result of the transaction is apparent before you're actually obligated to give the money. And so you will basically, you'll pay what it's worth to you. And if it's not worth anything to you, you won't pay. You, you don't have to worry about what other people are doing. If the work never comes to exist, that's not a tragedy. There will be other works. So I, I don't think the game theoretical dynamics work out like the tragedy of the commons. I'm curious. You've mentioned that you've, you've interviewed people regarding this concept of copyrights. Yes. Have you actually talked with artists about uh, the, the position yes. of copyrights? Yes. Um, actually, my family is in the music business, the classical music business, and I've talked with a lot of artists. Um, artists, it depends on who you talk to. If you talk to a superstar, um, I won't mention any names. Um, in any way, the classical music world you know, doesn't really have superstars, right? Um, they're making a fair amount of money off copyright, but even then, some of them are sympathetic, although not all. 
um, among orchestral musicians, and this is really interesting, for about 10, 15, in a lot of cases, 20 years, orchestral musicians have made no money off recording royalties. In fact, the, the orchestra that my family was associated with, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, has not even been making recordings for the last few years um, because nobody can pay the royalty rates that the Musicians' Union demands. Now, there's something, there's an aspect of shooting yourself in the foot here. If you're not making recordings at all, you're certainly not making any money. And yet, a lot of those musicians feel very strongly about copyright. And I, you know, since there's no economic interest there, I can only resort to psychological explanations. But it, it has nothing to do with, with their livelihood. They're very well paid, and they're not making any money from copyright right now. So, <clears throat> so art, artists, artists are a mixed bag. It's a limited sample to me. Sorry? It's, it sounds like you've got a limited sample mm -hmm. to me. Well, so an, an important, what he said was that it sounds like that's a limited sample. I don't just talk to classical musicians, believe me. Um, but one thing to note is that when a band, anyone other than like the Rolling Stones or U2 or something, when they release a CD, they don't make any money. They just want to get that CD out there. And the terms of their contract with their distributor are such that they, they hardly make a dime. Any band, <clears throat> for, for the vast majority of bands, any band that puts AdSense on its web page is going to make more money from the AdSense than from their CD sales. Except perhaps for, for direct CD sales of CDs manufactured by them at their concert, which people often buy as a kind of charity gesture. Um, next question. Yes, sir. Um, a little bit earlier, the, the Disney question came out of what happens if uh, Mickey Mouse goes out of copyright when everyone start making a, a movie, books, whatever, with Mickey Mouse in it. Um, how does trademark law fit into this, and what is your position on trademark law? Oh, the question is sort of about the difference between trademark law and copyright law. Trademarks, although they're both called intellectual property by the, the legal system, they're completely different. Trademarks are a way of preventing confusion, of, of preventing identity confusion. You want to know that when you're dealing with a party, they really are who they say they are. And if anybody could claim to be anybody, we'd have chaos. So uh, trademarks, totally fine, no problem. And if Mickey Mouse is your logo and it's trademarked, then no, some other person shouldn't be able to use it to identify themselves. But you can't say that, that the novel War and Peace is the logo of Tolstoy. That's different. Yes? So I think the, the, the kind of four different parts of IP are kind of important when you're trying to phrase an argument like this, especially uh -huh. um, patenting. It seems like through the history that we have, especially since there's this major uh, industrial focus around distribution and the regulations around it, that copyright has kind of grown into this you know, massive beast. Uh, but if you try to kill it off and say, okay, we live in a time where we don't need it anymore because we have this nice internet thing, I don't think that the arguments you've presented kind of deal completely with the, the economic desires of the creators. Currently, they're being fed, even to a limited degree, by this kind of greedy distribution complex. But once that goes away, aren't they going to insist on perhaps a more kind of strong form of patenting so that they can keep property over their, not the expression of ideas like in copyright, but in the utility of ideas? Because you were saying before, well, they're, they're going to get recognition if we do this watermarking stuff correctly. but. How do, you, how do you get value out of what you give to the world? There has to be this incentive. Well, the, so that, that, that question, um, I, I hate to say this. I don't, I don't mean to beat you over the head with it. But uh, well, I guess I don't hate to say it. That question reveals the myth that it just is not how creators make a living for the most part. We all want to think it is. But if you actually look at the numbers, it's not. If you were to shift away from the current system, uh, how would you kind of? I, I realize that a lot yeah. of creators don't make a lot of money, but presumably no, no, they, they don't make move, any money. Right. So, just, you know. so when they move to making this more money, uh -huh. aren't they going to start looking direct? So if they're directly brokering these agreements with us, uh -huh. won't they want to protect their side of the deal more, and won't that lead to kind of a, an emasculation of things like patenting and, and control over the original idea? Well, Pet, um, the comparison between patents and copyrights is, is very complex. Part of the motivation behind patents is to prevent companies from keeping secrets, especially about medical research. Um, <clears throat> there, so a, a direct comparison between patents and copyrights, I think, isn't really possible. Um, there are some aspects that are similar. But 
but no, I mean, the, the, one, the one right that is both sort of spiritually and economically important to creators, to creators of what is currently copyrightable material, is the attribution right. They need to know that their, their works are not being, um, that the credit for their works is not being stolen. Uh, and the integrity of the work is important. Now, the integrity problem is essentially solved. If you go to the author's website, the thing you download is their book. There's no doubt about that. Um, but the whole, the thing I'm trying to get at is that the internet makes it possible to have revenue streams that don't depend on the creation of an artificial property right. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, white shirt, yes. So say, say I'm creating a video game. It cost me $10 million to create it. I'm going to sell a million copies of it to recoup my costs as a publisher. And I've been a developer, you know, so I guess I could say I'm a content creator who's benefited from copyright. Um, how, what model do you see working for the uh, that, that's video a great, game publisher? That's a great question. And uh, you may not like the answer, but at least it'll be honest. Um, the question was, I'm a video game developer. It cost me you know, $10 million to, to develop this game. What, what model in this, this new world I'm proposing is going to pay for that? Any model we have, whether it's um, single monopoly right, whether it's global monopoly, that is, anybody can distribute. There's no monopoly, but they all have to pay royalties to the creator, which we've never tried, um, or the, the kind of free-for-all model that I'm proposing. Any model is going to emphasize and strengthen certain kinds of creations and de-emphasize or weaken the possibility of making other kinds of creations. For example, the big budget, special effects filled Hollywood movie. Um, that's kind of harder to make if you don't have strong copyright law. But the question is, are those things so valuable to us that we are willing to have a system that prevents people from sharing with each other? And especially given that technology advances inexorably, and it is now possible even as a lark in your spare time to create a science fiction thriller that 15 years ago would have required $50 million to create, I don't think it's a good argument for keeping copyright. Yeah? Uh, so I'm gonna do Hear me? Carl? Oh, yeah? If you have questions. Can't really hear you, sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Uh, do you mind if I take that one? Just all right, go ahead. Okay. We'll take one from the air. Thanks. Thanks, Carl. Um, I see you're drawing a distinction between kind of the, the blockbusters and the fine artists. And you're kind of dismissing the artists that really make a lot of money off of copyrights. However, would the infrastructure for that communication exist without the copyright, without being funded by copyrights, for instance? Would an artist who is, wants to record a CD and give it away, even have a CD or a CD player available to them and to their audience if it wasn't for the infrastructure that is bought and paid for through the industry? Um, I, I think that's a, that requires such a degree of speculation to know what would have happened with the internet that I, I couldn't even begin to answer it. but. I mean, the internet was started as more of a military research project than anything else. And I, I don't think that there's any evidence now that the pace of development or, or aggregation of the internet is going to slow down based on the presence or absence of copyright-based revenues. I mean, frankly, the, you, know, you could say that the development of the internet was mainly driven after its post-research uh, project phase by pornography. So, you know, I think, I think most of these most of these works we're talking about, although they have used the internet for distribution and of cop distribution of copyright materials in some cases, I don't think they're really important in, in making the infrastructure of the internet exist. But that's, it's a big what-if game, and you, know, you can't say for sure. I certainly can't say for sure. Anyway, go ahead. I'm Daphne Keller. I'm a copyright lawyer here at Google. Um, and I have office hours on Wednesdays across the street if you'd like to come talk about copyright. Uh, I just wanted to say, I, I think a lot, and we've talked about this before, yeah. I think a lot of your description of how early English copyright was driven by a monopoly held by the people who controlled distribution is true. And I think it's still true today that a lot of lobbying that goes on in DC is done by the distributors rather than the, the creators who are kind of these mythical beasts who are in 
to justify copyright often. However, US law is very much predicated on the idea that copyright is an engine driven by incentives to individual creators, and it's written into the Constitution. So that's what courts are looking at when they think about copyright. That's what Congress yes. is thinking about. And if you disagree with Congress about the idea that the best way to drive creation is with massive expansion of copyright to include 70 year terms and DMCA super protections based on unhackable technologies and so forth. If you think Congress got it wrong, I think the best way to persuade them is to demonstrate that production, creative production based on systems other than super strong copyright really works. So open source development, releasing things under Creative Commons licenses and so forth to sort of create a material example that we don't need these kinds of robust rights necessarily. Absolutely, and, and just to summarize, oh, what Daphne's saying is, if the way copyright is going to end, if it ends, is, although I'm not sure you're promoting that, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm, I'm, not really, I'm also not promoting when you said to copy things, if you think it's a good idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, is, is that creators themselves are going to start using these other distribution models independently of copyright law. They're just going to release stuff voluntarily under new models. And I think that's true. That's the engine that's really going to make this happen if it happens. But I think there needs to be a, a, a two-pronged approach because those laws are causing us great problems and are going to cause us much greater problems very soon. And the trouble is that, that DRM, digital rights management, and or digital restrictions management, as some of us like to call it, and, and um, the Digital Millennium and Copyright Act, unfortunately, these things are accurate expressions of democratic sentiment. Those laws reflect more or less the public's belief that copyright is necessary for creative development to happen. And if we don't change that assumption, the laws are going to be a very long time in changing. And artists are going to be a very long time in becoming willing to experiment. Whereas if artists start to get the idea that maybe copyright wasn't designed to help them in the first place, they may become a bit more willing. There's one other point I want to make. Uh, as Daphne pointed out, the legal basis of copyright in the US is in that constitutional clause. And that's, that's where the courts look um, <clears throat> at that and the, and the case law and, and further laws um, that are sort of based on it. But just because that clause says to promote the progress of science and the useful arts doesn't mean that's what the system was designed for. When Congress passes the Clean Water Act, that doesn't mean it's about cleaning the water. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that the authors of the Constitution were being insincere. They really believed in copyright. And given the technological and economic milieu in which they operated, it was a perfectly reasonable thing they were saying. Things have changed now, not just in a, in, a qual in a quantitative way, but in a very fundamental qualitative way. It's a different world. Yeah, I wanted to make a point here that the, for the common good basis of copyright and patents in US law may be true, but it's becoming moot because that's not the basis of worldwide copyright and patents. And treaties override US law. So treaties negotiated by federal government override any U.S. interpretation of copyright. So Sometimes. it depends on the implementing provision. The U.S. manages to resist complying with treaties a lot, and in this case, sometimes that's a good thing. Oh no, it's a legal discussion and a philosophical talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take more questions. <laughs> yes, sir. You got to be So my yeah. question, my question is not about artist royalties, but it's about works of art that cost a lot of money to make. So, for instance, let's say. I'm an independent movie maker who wants to shoot a documentary in the Antarctica, and it costs me X million dollars to make this movie. Now, if there's no system for copyrights in place, how do such educational and useful Well, um, well a good make? answer to that is, how do such things generally get created now? For the most part, somebody goes to a foundation and gets a grant. That's how most of that stuff happens. Um, it's not, you know, occasionally there's a big blockbuster success, like March of the Penguins or something. Um, but if you take a lot of the films, the educational and documentary films you like, you will find that somebody impoverished themselves and went out and wrote grant applications and borrowed money from their relatives to make it happen. And if you look at a lot of the books you like, if you look in the acknowledgments, there's often a foundation grant in there. The system really isn't paying for that stuff. OK. Uh, we are <clears throat> we're half an hour away from the Google policy talk, which again is over in Tech Talk 42. Um, I'm happy to stay here and continue taking questions, but those of you who had somewhere to be at 3, um, this is your chance to get up. Don't worry about it. I won't be offended. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>